Okay, we're good to go. The link works. You can hear me, you can see me, and you can see the slides. So we've met the bare minimum to start our second week of class. Thank you everyone for dealing with the slight delay and for showing up. Welcome back if you were able to attend or see last week's lecture. Again, this is the introduction to antenna basics course, and this is gonna be week two introduction to antenna testing. So I'm very excited about antenna testing because that's one of my favorite parts of the process. And my thinking in showing antenna testing before actual design is that people could start playing with it if they wanted, if they had antennas at home, and that knowing how to test antennas wouldn't hold you back um, if we kept it, unlike if we kept it towards the end of the class. So, end of the course. So, I have just a few quick housekeeping things. I made a small error in my slides last week and stated that isotropic antennas have one dB of gain, and that's incorrect. It's a one linear value. And if we remember that decibels are calculated as 10 times log 10 of the value, 10 log 10 of one is zero. So it has zero dB gain, which makes sense. Remember, it's a mathematical construct that you can't really build, and it's just a reference. So it has no actual gain itself. So I apologize for that. Um, I'm gonna mention class communication here in a minute. And I wanted to be sure to mention that there is gonna be a certificate of completion available for this course, and it's gonna be one final quiz. There are options for either doing a design and build or doing quizzes. And I thought one quiz would be the most accessible to everyone so that it doesn't exclude people who maybe don't have access to software or hardware or who simply didn't find time to actually build an antenna all the way through the course. So speaking of the certificate, which will have a final quiz, the important things from last class that you should know. Remember, an antenna is a transducer that converts energy between domains. Gain is based on power and includes losses. Polarization is a character characterization of the direction of the E field or electric field vector. And impedance matching is important because it maximizes the power transfer and minimizes the signal reflection from the load. And as I mentioned previously, RF power is mentioned in decibels or dB and as a relative unit, and that's the equation for it, 10 log um, with the relationship of the power. So again, those would be important things to know towards the end of the class. Real quick, going to class communication. I'm very grateful for the response. It's just been overwhelming for the course and the majority of everyone has been absolutely excellent, asked really great questions. Um, if we could keep the communication to just about the course material and only through Hackaday, that would be absolutely great. And any inappropriate comments are going to be flagged as such and removed. So let's keep it friendly. Let's keep it not weird. Let's just keep it about antennas. Thank you so much. Week two, this week, class outline. Today we're gonna to be talking about, first off, radiating responsibly, your near field versus your far field, range testing, scattering parameters or S parameters, very, very quick, high level view of Smith charts. I'm not gonna teach impedance matching within Smith charts because that can get a little overwhelming if you've never seen them before. Network analyzers and calibrating a VNA or vector network analyzer. Visuar versus return loss and what you should be looking for when you take those kind of measurements. And then a uh, brief mention of attenuators and dummy loads as they relate to testing. So a note on radiating responsibly. So this course was designed 
to kind of show the learning curve of a first year as a professional RF or antenna design engineer, right? So if I were speaking strictly to that, rating responsibly is something that's going to be included. However, I know I have a lot of new to RF engineering people in the course. I have a lot of amateur radio enthusiasts in the course. So I do want to mention, particularly since we're talking about testing, if you are radiating, you need to be within the appropriate band and power level um, that is applicable for you, right? If you're doing very low power within certain frequencies, you can use the ISM radio bands, you know, for the industrial, scientific, or medical use. Otherwise, you need an amateur radio license if you're playing around hobby with, uh, you know, kind of hobbyist use, and those require a license testing, and there's multiple levels. Otherwise, your signals need to be constrained if you're radiating out um, either within an anechoic chamber or dumped into a dummy load. And I'll mention that in more detail towards the end of the class, but I just don't want anyone radiating out into the open air at whatever frequency they want after seeing this course. So we're gonna jump into near field versus far field. And one of the things that you learn in antenna design when you're talking about your electromagnetic wave, it changes characterization um, the further out you go from your radiating antenna. And so the issue with the reactive near field, right, is that it is difficult to test to or to take measurements of. And it changes as you go out towards the far field. And out in the far field at a certain distance is when you start to get that really nice stable behavior and the plane wave that you can expect. And that's really easier for calculations and measurements. So there are ways to test within the near field. And I'll mention that briefly, I think on the next slide. But if you are testing at home, and you don't have access to you know, a near field range, you're going to want to be taking any kind of like gain measurements in that far field, right? And so the equation is here on the right and D is the largest diameter or dimension of your antenna, right? So it's two times the dimension squared over the wavelength. So this horn antenna, you know, the dimension isn't, widest dimension, it's pretty small, right? It might also be like the length of a dipole um, or of a Yagi antenna, things like that. But that's how you're going to be able to determine how to uh, set your receiving antenna far enough away to get that far field behavior that's best to characterize for measurements. So leading into range testing, as I said, there are near field ranges um, that they have, especially they are smaller, they're more compact and they can be easier to fit inside a building, right? If you have a very large wavelength, you're gonna need a lot more room, right? So that's why sometimes you'll see outdoor far field ranges and you can do those at your own home, setting up your antennas far enough away if you're doing those lower frequencies that are gonna have those longer wavelengths. Uh, typically at companies, you'll see an indoor far field range. That's what I have the most experience with. And that is, as you might see kind of on the picture on the right, you have one antenna transmitting. Um, it's the device under test, which is frequently abbreviated DUT. And then it's uh, radiating to your test antenna, right? And everything is contained within that in a code chamber. And that's where you see those foam spikes that help um, ab absorb that radiation and prevent it from leaking. They also have compact ranges that use a reflector. I'm not gonna be going over any of the math uh, to convert any of those measurements or on how to build those. There are very extensive papers on those and they're done by people much 
smarter than me, but what you want to as an antenna engineer, not as a test engineer specifically, but as the antenna engineer, what you wanna understand from this are gain cuts and coordinate systems, right? So antenna design is typically done in the spherical coordinate system where you have phi and theta um, around an axis, you know, to form a sphere. And you're gonna take certain cuts at certain um, angles of that, right? And that's going to typically characterize your antenna gain. There are, there's different lingo depending on what kind of culture you're in. Um, professionally, there are cuts called PPC or principal plane cuts. And those are gonna be, you know, your big um, X, Y and XZ or, you know, YZ cuts, you know, just like in this coordinate system where you have um, like this, right? Because we can't just have a really, ex we can't have a three-dimensional picture, right? So you have to learn how to plot the data. And I think I have some pictures to explain this better, um, particularly it's gonna be important antennas. I want the specific antenna, sorry, because it's gonna vary so much per antenna what your radiation pattern looks like. They can also be called, um, you know, conical cuts where you kind of swing around in a circle. They're sometimes are called azimuthal, I can't say it correctly, or elevation cuts. And that can kind of depend on what industry you're in. So. Unfortunately, one of the things um, that I was not very good at in school is rotating coordinate systems in my head. And that's why I became an electrical engineer instead of a mechanical engineer. But something when you're testing antennas is that you might have to learn how to rotate and understand how those antennas are working with each other as they radiate. And it's gonna be just a little bit different than when you're designing in the simulator and having it, um, you know, for example, radiated up in your simulator versus when you test like this, you just have to rotate everything to make sure you're getting the correct measurements. I want to lead into scattering parameters because I know that a lot of people uh, probably have some experience with this. And this is probably the most popular test measurement that is actually accessible to hobbyists or people just getting introduced. A lot of people don't have access to anechoic chambers, which is why I decided not to spend too much time on that. Network analyzers are probably, I would say, one of the most fundamental pieces of equipment you should learn how to use if you are going to be working in the RF. Now, I say that as, as a former intended design engineer, right? Depending on what your interest in RF is. It might be a spectrum analyzer or an oscilloscope if you're doing more RF board work. But for antenna design, passive design, network analyzers are where you're gonna spend a lot of your time. So I wanted to be sure to go over them extensively. So for scattering parameters, we have a two port network, right? We have some device under test in the middle and we have a reflection coefficient that leads to return loss. And we have the transmission coefficient that characterizes insertion loss, right? And so the mathematical way that you learn this is a lot of matrix multiplication in formal education. And it gets very extensive very quickly. You don't have to know it in depth to do the most basic measurements that you need to do for an antenna or a passive component. So I'm not going to go over the math in depth because it can be a, a little intimidating. Um, one of the things that you might see that I'm just going to mention because some people might have heard from it, might have heard of it, is transmission parameters or T parameters, and then chain parameters, also known as ABCD parameters. Those are just other ways of characterizing 
um, your coefficients and your losses as the way it transmits through your system or the way it reflects back through your system. There are conversions for that. I'm not going to cover them in class because I thought I thought S parameters would be enough. But talking about return loss versus insertion loss. And there are more S parameters than just these two, right? But these are the two most common and the two that you should have the best handle on if you're gonna be making these kinds of measurements, in my opinion. So return loss is the ratio of your incident power and your reflected power, right? How much power I put into this antenna gets reflected back. Now, if we think about it, and if we remember about talking about return loss and visoir from the last class, how much power do we want that we put in to be reflected back? Well, ideally we would want none, right? We would want all that power to go through, right? Remember, because impedance matching maximizes the power that goes through the antenna and it minimizes that reflection. So we really want our return loss to be very low. Now, insertion loss is how much power that we put into the device gets transmitted, right? How much loss occurs just going through the antenna or the waveguide or whatever else you're testing, right? Also known as your S21. And those are particularly important, uh, more so in maybe like waveguide and um, your passive components that are gonna add up as you get to your antenna. But, uh, but it's still important to consider because you're wanting to look at how much power is getting lost in the device. I'm going to talk very, very high level, as I said, about Smith charts. Primarily, I wanted to mention it because uh, Smith charts are how I prefer to some things when working with a vector network analyzer or VNA. And I know that there are a lot of circles and a lot of notations on the Smith chart if you've never seen one before, and it can be a little intimidating, but it there's three main points that I want you to take away from the Smith chart. And to lead into it, all a Smith chart does is plot impedance as a function of frequency, right? Think of it as if you had a plot on your x, y axis, just your basic, you know, algebra one plot. The problem with RF, right, is that we can have infinite impedance when we have an open circuit, right? So if you had a regular Cartesian coordinate system, x, y square plot, your impedance might be going off until infinity. How do you represent infinity well on that kind of graph, right? Instead of, and I don't mean just the mathematical notation of, oh, it's going off that way. Actual infinity is what we're trying to mathematically kind of measure here. So what they did is they just kind of wrap that into a circle. So there's a lot of lines and it looks kind of confusing, but the three main points I want you to take away from this are where the short circuit is, where the um, impedance match point is, and where the open circuit is on the chart, right? So your short, your short circuit is gonna be on the left and that's an impedance of zero, right? There's no importance, it's a short, you know, generally speaking, not ideal. And then on the opposite side, on the right side, we have the open circuit where your impedance is infinity, right? Remember, if you have an open circuit, nothing can pass. So it's like having an infinitely, uh, uh, an infinite impedance in there that prevents that path from closing. And then in the middle, you have your impedance matched point. And frequently in these kinds of systems, it's gonna be your 50 ohm point, right? And so 
I've linked to a video that kind of talks a little bit more about using a Smith chart with a VNA uh, at the end in the resources link that might be helpful. But the summary from this perhaps somewhat confusing slide that I want people to take away is where the short circuit point is, where the impedance match point is, and where the open circuit point is. And all this is, is just a way of plotting impedance. So getting into network analyzers. So all the network analyzer does is inject a known frequency and amplitude into an RF point an RF port, and then it measures the relative amplitude and phase of the signal when it comes back, right? Either through reflection from one point or if you're using two ports into the other port, right? And if you have a VNA, then particularly if you have one in your home, congratulations, they're a fantastic piece of equipment that can be very, very expensive, right? Um, I have a couple of leads that like to joke that they cost more than their house. And so they are certain pieces of equipment that you, sh you should be particularly careful with, particularly um, with electrostatic discharge protection. And so the reason I say this is I live in Colorado. It is very, very dry here, right? So there's a lot of static that happens frequently. So there are probably precautions here to be taken with RF test equipment that someone in Houston, Texas or Titusville, Florida might not necessarily have to take, right? But I'm going to urge caution, especially since I don't want you to um, go out and buy a VNA and then fry it. So you should always you know, wear your ESD wrist strap and um, one mistake that I have seen other people make is sometimes you'll get a patch antenna ordered from somewhere and it might have some kind of film on it to protect it, like a plastic film, um, like that you might get on electronics to protect the screen, right? And maybe you get very excited about testing your new antenna. So you decide to plug it into your VNA and you're gonna take measurements right away, right? And then you notice the film that's on the antenna and it's kind of bothering you. So you decide to rip the plastic film off whatever you're testing as it's plugged into your VNA. And you have just fried the bejesus out of a very expensive piece of test equipment because you have introduced electrostatic discharge into it. They can be very, very expensive to repair or send back for uh, calibration at the industry standard. So if you do get one, please uh, treat them carefully. If you have the big, fancy, expensive ones and be careful with that if you're working with them. One thing that I wanted to note, um, some of you may have seen this, they do make more uh, accessible and introductory VNAs now called the nano VNA that I just recently got. I'm sure there are people in the class that are much more experienced with them than I am because I got it less than 48 hours ago. But they uh, range from, uh, in US dollars, like maybe 50 to $100 if you're going for one of the uh, wider frequency ranges. And I think this one is from, this is the cheaper model from 10 kilohertz to I think one and a half gigs or one and a half gigahertz. Um, and it has two ports. So you can do some of these measurements at a more reasonable cost if that's of interest to you. If this is something that you're doing at home, they're not paying me or sponsoring me or anything. I just thought it was a fun piece of equipment to have. And I know a lot of people find the in cost of a VNA very prohibitive to getting introdu introduced to this kind of testing, right? And they can really be invaluable for characterizing your system. So I'm going to talk about calibrating a VNA because this is probably the 
biggest learning curve that I have had, um, one of the biggest learning curves that I have had as an RF engineer, because this is something that was not taught to me in school. I wish it was. Um, I was lucky to even get very brief access to a VNA when I was in college. Um, and there are lots of things that I had to learn the hard way professionally, right? So when you get a VNA, you have to calibrate it each time you're going to make a measurement. And this is going to be specific to your connector type. What I have on the right-hand side of the screen are the Cal standards for the nano VNA that I just showed. And those are SMA uh, Cal standards. There are standards for every kind of connector uh, that you can think of. And there are even waveguide calibration standards. Um, those, the waveguide calibration procedure is a little more complicated. So I'm just going to talk over the SMA Cal procedure because I figured it would be the most common to everyone attending the class. And without walking you through it um, on the nano VNA because it's, it's a little different. The basic steps are that you want to set your frequency range first, and then generally you can follow and do a short open load or through calibration if you are gonna be using two ports. For example, if you're going to be taking that insertion loss measurement, um, you're going to need to characterize the loss that goes through each of your two ports on your VNA, right? Now, if you're only doing uh, return loss, you can do a one port calibration and that's just short, open and load or 50 ohms. And those are the abbreviations that you'll frequently see, um, SOLT or SOL. Walking you through the screen left to right on these standards um, is a through Cal standard. So you would connect that in between like two cables um, on your VNA, measure that loss. The next is your load and then your open. So you can see how it kind of looks empty in there. So kind of how you might think of an open, right? There shouldn't be anything in there. And then the short, and you can see that looks different than a regular SMA connector um, because there's no like dielectric in there. It just goes straight to metal, right? So you're shorting out that port, much as the name suggests. And the number one thing that I would recommend if you are doing a calibration of your VNA is to always double check the cal that you did. And this is the number one thing that I wish I had known or learned sooner. Um, and so looking into that, and I know I have some amateur radio enthusiasts in the audience and calibrating a VNA takes some time, right? It takes a few minutes and that's um, if you know what you're doing, if you torque the connectors properly, um, which you're, you're doing it professionally, you should. And that's if you can find the Cal standards, right? They're always in a box uh, laying around somewhere. If you're working with other people, half the time they tend to take them off somewhere and you can't find them. So I know people can be resistant to even the idea of calibrating in the first place, but it's very, very important if you want to have any kind of fidelity in your measurements, right? And so I know that double checking everything that you went through is not the most fun experience, but I promise you this is one of the things that has saved me the most times um, that I've done. So all this is, is once you go through your calibration, going through those standards again, having your Smith chart on the screen and actually, you know, attaching your short uh, Cal standard again, and then looking at the switch chart. Is it actually where your short circuit is supposed to be, right? There on the left hand side of the Smith chart. And it should actually be, look pretty similar to what's on the screen. It should be a point. It should be close together. It should not be squiggly lines all around, right? 
and it shouldn't be off from that. You might have a little bit of error if you have um, particularly some older or cheaper cables, they're gonna introduce some phase error into your system. But this way, at least you know how far you're off, right? Particularly in some systems or even professionally, you might need to know down to tenths of dB of loss, what your measurements come down to. So that kind of accuracy is going to be really important. And then the same thing through the rest of your standards. When you reattach the open Cal standard on the Smith chart on the VNA, does is the actual measurement, the readout on the screen where the open should be? Again, on the right hand side of the screen, just like a point. Same for your load when you do that. And it's important if you are using both ports to do this um, for both of your ports to see if you have a bad port, to see if you have a bad connector, to see if you didn't torque it properly, to see if you have a cable going out, right? Um, and particularly if you're going to be doing this professionally, I would always tell you to, when you double check your cal, to save this readout, to always have your back, right? So again, Calibrating a VNA is can sometimes be a little bit time consuming, especially if you're first learning how to do it, but it is important. Um, one thing I do wanna note about the Cal standards on the screen, these are not your typical Cal standards because they came with the nano VNA, right? So they are much more accessible in terms of price, right? If you get your hands on a pair of more professional kill standards that are geared towards a VNA, you want to be very, very careful when you are attaching them, particularly because you can bend pins or um, inside here, it's little teeth, right? And if you bend one or strip one out, it can cause a lot of problems. And it's something that's very, very expensive to fix. So, the takeaway from these slides are that calibration is important. Uh, you should always double check it. If you are in ham radio and you're just wanting to do like a live or dead test, you don't necessarily have to go through this. You can even uh, hook up your antenna to your network analyzer and wave a piece of metal in front of it to see if it changes, to see, uh, to make sure that something is even remotely working, right, with what you've designed. And next I'm gonna talk about VISWAR versus return loss. We talked about this in the last class. And so the return loss plot is on the bottom of the screen. If you remember from last class, we talked about return loss going from zero to negative infinity. And this is measured in dB, plotted in dB. And we want this number to be low for a good impedance match. And you might see when I was taught, I was uh, told that 10 dB of return loss is really the minimum that you want um, if you are designing an antenna. So you can see here the bandwidth or the frequency range that this is good is from uh, about, you know, six gigahertz to it starts getting a little dicey after, you know, 25 gigahertz. And so that's your bandwidth of range of the um, impedance matching of that antenna here. If you are working to more stringent requirements, you might have something more along the lines of 20 dB of return loss. That would be considered something very good particularly for if you're gonna do space applications, you're gonna need those um, tighter requirements for your system. And then if you notice the VISWAR plot on the top, that's almost kind of an inverse, right? It's not inverse mathematically, but it looks kind of like a flipped measurement because you're going from one to positive infinity, right? So again, we want this number to be low 
as low as possible to indicate that we have a really good impedance match. And someone asked the other day, but you cannot, um, by the laws of physics, have or mathematically have a visoire of zero, right? So your visoire plot should always start at one, right? Because it's physically impossible to have a visoire of lower than one. Uh, one visoire is considered a perfect impedance match, right? And you'll see uh, differing opinions on what uh, is a good requirement for visoire. Lots of times you might see like below two or below 1.5 for antennas if you are first learning design. If you are designing towards more stringent requirements, like space applications, your visoire requirements might be something like 1.1, 1.15, right? They're gonna be much, much tighter. Again, same as for the return loss. But I like this block because I wanted to show visoire and return loss side by side. Again, they're both measuring the impedance match of your input port to your antenna. It's just different ways of looking at uh, the same information. And real quick, just because we are talking about test equipment and uh, someone asked recently, and I thought this would be a good idea to include in the class, is attenuation. And this is gonna be more if you are putting any kind of RF power into test equipment, right? And the point of attenuation, just like it sounds, is to reduce signal level. There are a couple applications, other applications of it, of doing kind of like a quick and dirty impedance match, but primarily here I'm focused on when you want to reduce your signal level so that you don't fry the front end of your test equipment, right? Um, and so on the right is one SMA um, attenuator that I happen to have that's 6 dB. And this is something that you should pay attention to if you're ever passing a signal into a piece of equipment uh, particularly very sensitive measuring equipment. And especially if you are testing a transmitter that you built along with your antenna and you think maybe you got the power level right or maybe you were really trying to max it out, you have uh, several stages of amplification in there, you're going to be want to be careful and know the limits of your test equipment so that you're not trying anything. And as I mentioned earlier, for a dummy load, it's basically just, you know, kind of a bucket that collects your signal instead of radiating it out, right? Um, and so this has a different kind of connector on it than we've seen previously. But the point is, if you do not have a legal way to radiate and test equipment, you should always be terminating um, your signal so that you're not radiating radio, radio waves when you shouldn't be um, as a violation of FCC. So I wanted to walk through uh, some of the resources and I should have remembered to say this at the beginning of class, but I recently found an open source antenna modeling and simulation design tool. I know that well, it's always a popular question that I get asked and uh, it was one question that was asked in the first class about you know, low cost or open source modeling and simulation tools because they tend to be very, very expensive, right? Um, and this is a link to one that I just started, uh, just found out about and just started trying. It is free for the first 10 days and then it's 25 US dollars a month or I think 20 euros a month after that. Um, and so they're not paying me or anything to market it. I just thought the class would be interested, which is why I posted it on the course page. Um, but if you missed it, uh, that's something that you might be interested in trying. On the nano VNA that I uh, have talked about a little bit, you can see how tiny the screen is. And it can be uh, kind of difficult to see and also 
someone made a code to save it as touchstone files, which is the standard file type when saving network analyzer data. And so that's a link to that code that was suggested. Um, I haven't used it personally. It was recommended by a friend who is much, much smarter than me who has used it and I trust his opinion. If you are interested in looking at different kinds of professional antenna ranges for your needs, or if you're wanting to actually build one, I have a link to a paper that might be of interest, but it goes more a little bit into the math and description of the actual electric field. If you're getting more into what your options are with ranges, or if you're considering going out of house and you know paying for testing of your antenna. Um, there's a link to a blog post that goes more into depth with insertion loss versus return loss, just in case there's any confusion with that. Uh, the next two articles are on Hackaday and they talk about, the first one talks about the nano VNA. It was a write-up done that in case anyone was interested, I wanted to link to. And the next is a person who made their own CAL standards, which is very impressive and can be very difficult to do. So if you are, if you have an interest in something like that and you're looking for a challenging project, uh, that would be something to look into. And then the last is a video by Keysight talking about using a Smith chart and VNA, um, and they test a uh, paperclip as an antenna. And it kind of walks you through a similar way that I did, except they don't go on as much about double checking your cow. Um, but they explain kind of the basics of the Smith chart and show how it stacks up against measuring, not a real antenna, it's a paperclip, but it shows that it can be resonant. So, Coming up in the next class, we're going to get into actual wire design. So the topics that we're going to go over are dipoles, um, you know, quarter wave monopoles, um, half wave dipoles. Uh, Yagi's I'll spend uh, a little bit of time on and kind of briefly cover balance because that's important to mention in that context. And Helixes, helical antennas, I wasn't sure where else to put that in the class. Um, technically, it's a wire antenna, so it's a little bit different in that they are, they tend to be higher frequency and circular polarization, so they're a little different in both polarization and frequency range than the other two antennas naturally, um, but that was the best place I could think to put them. Okay. Well, with that, thank you for attending and asking so many very good questions. I'll put the link or I'll put the note about the Smith chart book textbook recommendations on the course uh, page. I'll look into a better resource for explaining the near field versus uh, far field actual uh, characteristic transaction uh, transition as to what's happening there. And I will see y'all next week and we'll do some wire antenna design. Thank you so much.